My name is uh, Bruno Waterfield. And my day job is Brussels correspondent for the Times of London, but I also um, have a lot of interest in, in European um, history, particularly the interwar period, the great the lost uh, 1930s, and I've given papers at the Academy uh, event that's organised by the Institute of Ideas on, on, uh, on fascism particularly. We're going to be discussing uh, the past we want to know part of it and looking at the legacy of futurism. Today often seems rather tired, rather exhausted in terms of politics um, and economics and the, the idea of the future as a realm of exciting, ecstatic development of aspiration for a utopia, um, a prospect that helps us or a prospect that unleashes tremendous uh, energies seems really, really a long way away. It actually seems to be in the past, actually, doesn't it? Because nowadays, um, if, if there's one thing that defines how we think about the future, particularly in, in terms of mainstream uh, contemporary uh, literature and sort of discussion and thought, um, it is the future as a place of doom, perhaps, um, a place uh, of decline. Um, progress is no longer what it was. People tend to be rather hostile to the idea that progress even exists. So this is a discussion to try and recapture some of that energy, or rather to look at why it was at the turn of the 20th century, and particularly after the First World War, why it was that people like Marinetti um, could have uh, such um, a faith and such a belief um, in modernity as uh, an explosion of human creativity um, and an expansion of life uh, without precedent um, in history. Now, we have a really good panel uh, to uh, discuss this. Um, and the way it's going to work is Elisabetta is going to uh, give us an introduction, and then we'll have a discussion um, and a conversation about that, and we'll bring in you, the audience, to start to you know, get your thinking caps on. I want to try and, and have quite an intensive um, discussion because it throws up some very interesting historical moments um, and problems, and, and perhaps more excitingly, it, it, it's going to be about how we, how we think about the future uh, too. So, Elisabetta will speak, Elisabetta Gasparoni, and she's the convener of the Future Cities Project Readers Group. She is, you will notice, an Italian, <laughs> so she's close to this. And what she likes about futurism is its courage, the defiance a hurling defiance at the stars. So she likes the courage and defiance in the face of uncertainty. And there are two other people on the panel who will be discussing what Elisabetta uh, says. Is on my left, uh, Chris Adams, the assistant curator at the Esterick Collection of Modern Italian Art. I've been to the Esterick. I uh, a, bought a lot of postcards to take away. It's the only collection in this country of, and the collection of Italian modernism and some of the most iconic futurist works such as Boccioni's Modern Idol. What he likes about futurism is its optimism. On my right, um, we have uh, Dr. Simona Storchi. She, you will notice, is an Italian as well. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as I was saying, this is one of the interesting you know, Italy at the turn of the 20th century, Italy after the Great War, was not a place that one would have associated with a self-belief, a muscular self-belief in leaping and hurling into the future. Now, Simona has written a book called Futurists, the Avant-Garde and its Legacy. Now, what Simona likes about the futurists is their sort of dreams and their utopian aspiration, but, and it's a pretty important um, but the politics was pretty nasty. Elisabetta. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Um, I'm going to read a speech that I wrote for the uh, London Festival of Literature. Um, 
thank you. And uh, uh, on the uh, topics, future cities. And uh, it was last week, uh, last Saturday, and I think that uh, uh, it is an absolutely fantastic introduction to our session. It's uh, four minutes long, so please bear with me. The question was what role, if any, can writers play in reimagining our urban spaces? And what I wrote is the following. I'm going to talk of the role that an Italian writer played in reimagining urban spaces. He lived at the beginning of the 20th century when humanity was thought to proceed by means of steam energy and electricity and speed and the sight of a commerce and crowds the noise of industry and traffic were celebrated. He was the founding father of Futurism, a movement he started in 1909 by publishing the founding and manifesto of Futurism. His name is Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Already when 17, he created his first literary magazine. He became a very prolific writer his poems, reviews, and reportage appeared on newspapers and literary journals. Before 1909, he published two plays and two books of poetry. One verse collection of short poems was entitled The Carnal City and took up a metropolitan experience. But it was in the founding and manifesto of futurism that Marinetti captured the frenzied activity of city life that became a symbol of the vitality of modern civilization. Marinetti and his manifesto would inspire many other writers to celebrate and reimagine the modern Italian capitals. After the publication of his uh, manifesto, futurism became the focal point for a vast debate that stretches across Europe and expanded into all the arts. The theoretical writings and manifestos that Marinetti and the Futurist wrote came to represent a sor sort of hymns to a new vision of the modern metropolis, and they covered literature, music, the visual arts, architecture, drama, photography, film, dance, fashion, advertising, even cooking. Futurism was based on the complete renewal of human understanding that has occurred as an effect of science's major uh, discoveries. In his theoretical writing entitled The Futurist Sensibility, Marinetti wrote that the earth shrank by speed and men had conquered the sense of the house, the neighborhood in which they lived, the city, the region, the continent. For Marinetti, his contemporaries possessed the sense of the world. They needed to feel themselves at the center, to feel that they were judges and motors of the infinite, both explored and unexplored. According to him, these new perceptions had already caused a gigantic increase in the sense of humanity and an urgent need to coordinate at every moment his contemporaries' relations with all the rest of the world. Marinetti's vision of an ideal society inspired the 26 years old architect Antonio Santelia to write the futurist architecture. A manifesto which has acquired a legendary status has, uh, as his bold sketches influenced modern architecture. His vision was for a highly industrialized and mechanized city of the future which is so not as a mass of individual buildings, but a vast, multi-level, interconnected, and integrated urban conurbation designed around, around the life of the city. In his uh, Città Nuova, or New City, reinforced uh, concrete was a favored material, and the building's uh, mechanics were no longer concealed, but exposed. For Santelia, stairs had to be abolished, and the elevators had to swarm up the facade like serpents of glass and iron. His new city was an interconnected network of traffic streams where houses lasted less time than humans did, and where every generation had to make its own city anew. 
Saint Elia's drawings give us a picture of um, modernism as an energizing yet benign force and suggest a new world where bridges and towers leap over space. He created a vision of the possibilities of modern architecture that surely stands at the high point of the Italian futurist imagination. Marinetti's visionary literature influenced many and still inspires many of us, I hope. I cannot help but be exhilarated by the sense of power and possibilities I feel when I read his texts. This writer believed that uh, future of humankind was filled with the infinite opportunities, and he celebrated the unstoppable, unlimited, evolving urban space. To your question, what role, if any, can writers play in reimagining our urban spaces, I'm going to answer a critical one. They should continue to inspire us with new forms and new compositional techniques and plunge us into the exhilaration of new possibilities. As Marinetti said in 1909, I feel like I have to stand up, but I, I have not. Lift up, lift up your heads, standing erect on the summit of the world, once more we fling our challenge to the stars. And um, you imagine the first question that came from the floor was about, well, what is, what is, uh, the, what is the relationship with fascism? And, um, and you know, my response is that uh, um, fascism um, as a movement was born in 1919 as a party 1921. So uh, futurism, uh, futurism started in 1909. And I uh, see that um, fascism appropriates some of the type of commandments that a futurist had, like, uh, yes, hate, like violence. But then we have to contextualize why they were writing what they were writing. And um, um, please uh, take into account that still Italy was under the domination of the Austro-Hungarian. So they were really entering public spaces and burning flags uh, just to um, alert and uh, excite Italians to rebel and take up the arms and, uh, and fight against the dominators. Okay. I stop there. Yeah, now what I want to do sort of beginning, let's just separate things out a little bit. I want to start with the, your sort of futurist manifesto that you gave yourself. Let's just, because as you said, that was 1909. So let's just put fascism to one side, just for the first bit, and we'll, then we can come to why the politics yeah. got nasty. Um, but first of all, let's just focus a little bit more on, on this, this, this sort of hypermodernism, the futurism of 1909. 1909, the world was a pretty exciting place. The future seemed to be a linear and accelerating progress towards um, a utopian future, both in terms of, of technology, but also for many people um, in terms of, of politics um, as well. So, Chris, can you just tell us a little bit more about um, futurism and, and why it's exciting, and perhaps why, um, in terms of the asterisk collection, the, the, some of the differences between you know, modernism and futurism, or what the relationship is a little bit. I sort of share Elisabetta's excitement towards futurism and its sort of enthusiastic embrace of, um, of modern possibilities. And I do, I do agree, I suppose, with the overarching sort of philosophy of futurism uh, and this sort of belief that um, the machine and technology can influence um, uh, humanity's development, development for the better. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's a, a very sort of positive message. In terms of the Esteric collection, the works we have are from this very early phase um, of of the movement, which, as Eliz Elizabeth was saying, sort of pre predated fascism. But I, I do think that, in a way, that that has been sort of used by art historians as an excuse to sort of let the early futurists off the hook politically. Um, I do think that a lot of the things that Marinetti was saying in those early years uh, were no different to the things he was saying in the later period when 
his actual association with fascism has led the later phase of futurism to be completely ignored. And um, I've just finished a PhD looking at the 1940s um, in relation to futurism. And, and it's, it's completely discounted because of this association with, with, with fascism, um, this very sort of obvious association. But Marinetti wasn't saying anything different then to what he was saying in 1909, 1911, when he went off to Libya and wrote in his diaries about the thrill he had killing Arab soldiers with his bare hands. So um, I, I, think, I think the movement is uh, problematic. I know you don't want to talk about fascism particularly, but I, th I think this early phase of the movement um, has sort of got away, uh, you know, a bit off the, say, sort of scot free, really, because people can't ignore the Chris, art historical so what, what importance. What would you say was the, the sort of embryonic aspect then of, 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 of early futurism that lent it to later fascism? Well, it's, um, it's belief that, you know, to use a contemporary phrase, you know, they had to make Italy great again, yeah. you know, um, uh, through colonialism. Um, you know, ultranationalism, um, this phrase that Marinetti said that, you know, Italy, the word Italy has to dominate the word freedom, um, self-proclaimed very aggressive uh, foreign policy. Um, you know, I, I think all of these aspects uh, fed into that. Brilliant. So, so again, if you could tell us a little bit more, what, what, why did, you know, the avant-garde was exciting. So tell us a bit more, you know, why why this legacy? Well, um, avant-garde was exciting. Futurism was exciting. The first marine, uh, manifesto published in France, incidentally, so not in Italy. The uh, Manifesto of Futurism uh, in February 1909 was uh, exciting. It was all about embracing modernity, embracing technology embracing modern life, embracing the machine, glorifying the present. So it's quite interesting that while futurism is called futurism, it's, it's very much about the present. Um, but of course, uh, uh, there's something qu a, a little bit disturbing about this kind of uh, glorification, because as, as Chris was saying, uh, um, Ultranationalism is also embedded in the first manifesto. So while the futurists were uh, glorifying technology, they were glorifying um, electricity, they were glorifying speed, they were glorifying cars and everything that came with modern life, they were also uh, staunch nationalists. Um, and they were also in supporting war. So fundamentally, you know, f futurism is a, a warmongering, uh, pretty much, uh, movement. Could you, could you explain to us a little bit about what, what, how it was that they expressed that? Why was war so appealing? Because, pre precisely because of the, uh, the, the, the nationalism that was embedded in the, so the, the strong sense that Italy uh, had to become great again. And of course, uh, in, in 1909, that meant that basically Italy had to catch up with the rest of Europe. So in a way, you know, the sort of uh, support of uh, colonialism just simply meant that Italy had, become, uh, had to become modern, as modern as the other countries. So um, sort of the nationalism that was promoted in Italy wasn't at that point, that much different from uh, you know, any form of uh, nationalism in Europe. So there was a kind of combination between, uh, uh, if you want, um, glorification of modernity and technology, which was exciting and interesting and uh, full of new possibilities, but, and, and, and nationalism. Um, and that, in a way, led the futurists, uh, after the war, to actually support uh, uh, fasc fascism, which was an ultranationalist yeah. movement after all. So, Elisabetta, the, 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 there is a charge here that, that um, behind this um, perhaps rather blind um, celebration of the future that was really an accelerated present, a sort of speeding up of the present, there was this rather anti-humanist or anti-human 
aspect in terms of the glorification of war and, 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 and whilst, I mean, one of the things we do have to say at this point is that before the First World War, many people were very excited about war. Many people yeah. were very excited about the collapse of the, of the old order and even people like, you know, Stefan Zweig, who was a very died in the war pacifist by after the First World War, very enthusiastically um, joined the Austro-Hungarian uh, army of the day and, and, and people saw perhaps that the, 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 the First World War would sort of tidy up a bit of creative uh, uh, destruction and, 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 and obviously uh, the reality was rather <coughs> was rather different than that but, but Elizabeth you, you, you gave us a, <coughs> a view of, of, of futurism as a progressive exciting um, vision um, of the future and, and isn't that perhaps its problem um, is that Within it, there isn't really um, a path to the future. I mean, the, I thought Chris work, the way Chris put it was really good as well. You know, the word Italy is greater than freedom, and and, and isn't that the problem of of just making a fetish of technology and an aesthetic of speed, perhaps to give one example, without really setting out a political program. Yeah, I have a question basically, you know, okay, for Elisabetta. Okay, okay. Is basically the question is is believing in progress intrinsically progressive? Oh dear me. Can I <laughs> Can I start first of all to talk about uh, actually these uh, um, fascist elements in the futurist. Now, um, we are saying or you are saying that um, um, it is because the nationalism, intrinsic in futurism, that you know prelude to fascist. But so let's uh, go back to the um, Italian unification. I think that that is another you know great example of really nationalism. You know everybody was so nationalistic. They they really the three war of independence uh, were fought against uh, the uh, dominators in the name of a great Italy, the, the, you know, a, a project of a unification of Italy. And so it was also when futurists started their path towards the war, they didn't want the Austrian-Hungarian uh, um, Empire be in Italy. And, uh, and yes, um, it's true, uh, there was the tendency to be um, um, uh, um, to colonize, but that was, you know, at that time, at that time, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, in Europe, uh, you had to be a colonizer, otherwise you were really a mosquito, you know, uh, type of nation. So that was part uh, but, but uh, really better, of, but, of but, the history but of, of the problem, Europe. Is, is definitely the modernist moment at the turn uh, of the 19th century into the 20th century was also the imperialist movement, which brings you again very much back to Simona's problem, which is a uh, question, which is, is it always progressive to support progress or is progress always progressive? So answer that question now. Okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, the absolute uh, um, is an impossible question. Now, let's see, at that time, I, I think that uh, um, progressive was intrins intrinsically progressive. You know, I think that futurists, they wrote uh, in so many manifestos, uh, you know, they, they have been published in a book, and it, it is 600 pages of uh, written literature, where futurists are really... Okay, they, they became repetitive, uh, you know, after the 20s. But in the first 10 years uh, um, of their life, few, the, the movement really was uh, uh, producing vision, a bold vision of what Italy should have uh, become. And, and they were really public. It, it, it was not just a, you know, a poet, a writer, or an architect just writing in a corner. They were publicly going into the squares and uh, entering the public spaces and really fight their cause. But, so, but, but I think the thing is, progressiveness is progressive. But I think, I think the problem with, with, with futurism is that often progression is, is kind of mistaken with uh, radical, being radical and revolutionary. 
I don't think that being, being radical or rev revolutionary is necessarily in, intrinsically progressive, unless the values you're espousing are progressive themselves. And um, I, I know that, uh, yeah, obviously, if they wanted to become sort of a, a player on the world stage, they, they felt they had to do certain things and they pushed for certain goals. But other people were pushing for an alternative uh, vision of what, of what the world could be. So it wasn't like a, a one-size-fits-all sort of approach, I don't think. Um, okay, right. No, I'm going out to the audience now, and I want to ask the audience this question. Is progress always progressive? And is it always progressive to scream and shout, you know, progress now, progress faster, 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 faster? Um, so I'd like people in the audience to think about that question, to really consider it, because for many people, of course, futurism and its link, uh, particularly with fascism, also Stalinism, um, as well is an expression or, of the reality that pro progress wasn't good. But look at the history of the 20th century. Look at the history of these ideas. Look at the 20th century of wars. And some people would argue that now perhaps we have less of an aggressive, uh, ecstatic view about accelerating the future faster, faster, and faster. We have less wars less brutalism. So I'd, I'd, I'd like some people in the audience to, to bring in their thoughts here as well. And, and also as well, let's not be too down on the futurists. I mean, Elizabeth, when we were talking before, and, when, and the quote from, from, from Marinetta, you have to admire that courage and that defiance. Although, of course, the, the ultimate question is also uh, how far, I mean, they, the, the futurists believe that, you know, Italy has had to become great again. So the other question is, how far um, do you go to make Italy great again? Um, again, as an, inter and as an intellectual in the public sphere, you know, what kind of positions? Because as Elisabetta was, uh, was saying, the futures were very public. They weren't just writing in their corners. They would organize public events. They were very public in their manifestations. So as an intellectual in the public sphere, what are your responsibilities? Who are you? How far do you go? Um, so that's, that's also another question. So I was, I don't, necessarily think believing in progress is inherently progressive because I think it depends how much you're willing to sacrifice to get to that progress and I think it depends on what you define as progress um, like I know it's like, cheesy to use Harry Potter but is it for the greater good or whatever you're doing like what do you have to sacrifice to call what you call progress like I wouldn't want to prevent racism by killing all the white people in the world Okay, and so uh, what, when, when you think about the future, does it excite you, or do you think the future's kind of scary? I don't think it's scary. I just find it rather depressing. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. yeah, so just, just, just whether these guys were fascists and ultra-nationalists or not, because actually everyone was an imperialist in, in 1909, for example, and actually more or less everyone, including sort of Fabians and... A lot of socialists were actually racists as well, scientific racists in, in those days. Um, so what it, but they were excited about the future, and they, they didn't find the future depressing at all. In fact, they used to get far too overexcited about the future. So why do you find the future depressing? I think in 1909, they could not have possibly foreseen all of the problems that we face today. So... In my opinion, one of the main problems facing humanity is the environment, the huge population that we have, the unsustainability of the world. But back then, they didn't, like, that wasn't even a consideration because the baby boom happened in the 50s. Like, they didn't need to think about the kind of things that are causing all the problems of today. I think that the future must have been exciting back then. I think the future must have been exciting in the 90s and the 80s when we didn't know and have as much information. And I think the more information you get, it seems the more depressing it gets. 
Well, I mean, in terms of the last remark, it's very interesting that actually uh, many environmentalists these days or many Malthusian environmentalists might also enjoy strangling some uh, Africans, uh, maybe to reduce the population uh, 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 blight in this, in this world. But, I, but in terms of the futurist thing, I don't have a downer on futurism. I get, it, I get all the points that the other two members of the panel are making, but uh, in the context that we might want to look at it, then progress is progressive. However, then Bruno said, is progress about screaming about progressive things that aren't necessarily progressive? In which case, no, it's not progressive. And if you're talking about progressive things uh, and misnaming them progressive because actually they're completely reactionary, but calling them progressive, then that's also not progressive. So, I mean, I think we just have to recognize the nature of progress. And in t terms of today's society, reflecting back on the futurists, then I am absolutely in favor of what they were doing, given today's sense of miserabilism, where the future is a bleak, depressing place to be. So I kind of think we have to contextualize it not only in its own terms, but also in terms of relationship to today. Because in many ways, I mean, I'm, I'm living in China, and uh, the idea of a greater China putting freedom second uh, is essential to the entire development of the last 50 years of the Chinese economic miracle. And you could then say, in retrospect, or even today, you could say then that's a bad thing. And I agree. The democracy should trump all. But pragmatically, I understand what China has done and how it's actually lifted all these people out of poverty. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in some ways, China recognizes that to, to achieve what it's done, it has to suppress freedom. I don't agree with it, but I get it. And in some ways, there's a similar thing with futurism. I don't agree with it, but I get it. But Austin, so how do we measure progress? Do we measure progress merely as GDP? Merely as GDP, the acceleration of GDP, great leaps forward and all the rest of it? Or do we measure progress in other more, you know, perhaps less sort tangible. of scientific and tangible uh, ways, such as artifacts of freedom. So one of the accusations against the futurists is even uh, most optimistic, they, they didn't often have people very much um, in their mission. It tended to be machines and speed. Marinetti once wrote that the most exciting thing about a skyscraper is its frame as it goes up and then it's ruined when people go and live in it and occupy it and use it as offices and turn it into, he said, rather distastefully. Yeah, obviously, um, 19, 1909 was all about taking the car while drunk and trying to run over people. I understand. The man was an idiot, right? Uh, but generally, I'm, I'm in, look, you could say futurism in terms of its output, its art, as art, yeah. was phenomenal. Right, of a moment, representation of speed, that whole transformational in art, in sculpture, was, was a phenomenal moment. So you could just have a conversation on that, in which case we might not be having this political conversation. But I do think that in terms of progress, obviously the liberation of humanity, the social uh, advances that humanity can gain, they may have technical aspects, but they're also about liberation and humanity, is really what I think of as progress. I'm simply saying that at that particular time, the dynamic of seeing the future as a positive place to be, however reactionary or however negative the way that they thought they should get there, is something which at, in today's society we should recapture. Okay. And I think that's worth holding on to, because do remember that there is an aesthetic quality to this discussion um, as well, and, and the futurist aesthetic and the modernist aesthetic, which is also slightly tainted by, by some of these... Um, associations is a very, very powerful aesthetic, and an aesthetic that is associated with, particularly in America, um, with freedom. So if you read someone like John Passos, Manhattan Transfer, I'm going to go with the audience no. quickly, this gentleman no. here, and then... No. 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 Just a, a brief point. It's also about the position of the artist in this modernity, because Marinetti was very well aware that whether he liked it or not, technology was going ahead. Uh, those were his times, and so where is the artist's position or the intellectual position in all this? Are we going to embrace it? Are we going to reject it? And so he made his choice. So there's also that component. So where the um, intellectual, the artist, uh, is positioned with respect to uh, the sort of technological advances of modern society. OK, where is the artist uh, positioned with respect to technological advance? The artist, the architect, the person of genius, is no longer all that important. You could see the remainder of the 20th century right up to the present day as being a living out, consciously or unconsciously, 
of the Futurist Manifesto. It's over. It's so 20th century. If you want to know where Futurism is now and progressivism, find the Esterit Gallery. It doesn't shout about itself. You have to discover it. It's a charming, faded memory of modernism. It's not where we are now. And the lady who spoke first really nailed where we are now. We're at a time of a crisis of self-esteem. The human race has exhausted all of its confidence and its energies in the rage and aggression and certitude of futurist thinking. And we now have to realize that we can't go on any longer that way. We can't afford nationalism, even though there's a resurgence of nationalism in the face of globalism. We can't afford it. It's too dangerous. It's kind of agreeing with all the points all together, but I think as a young person, I think a lot of young people are very frustrated at the moment what the future looks like. And we do, we want to help, but it's very, it, it's very fearful because um, cause of so many pressures we have that um, we have to do just get a job and make money and be part of that kind of network of money making machines. And so um, I just think it's kind of, and it's fear that's stopping us from doing it. I mean, if you think about it, 1909, pressure's on you to, to, to work and get a job. You would have been working, oh, I think you'd have been working probably a 12 hour day. Yeah. Um, for most people in those days, a lot of job insecurity, a hell of a lot of job insecurity. Um, and so, you know, the pressures to, to knuckle down and do work, you'd have been leaving school at 14 if you were lucky. But then um, there was so, other things. So why is, it, why is it then that people weren't so fearful? Why are you fearful when the world's a lot better, even though it's not perfect? So it's been progress, like Austin said, because you don't have to work. 12 hours a day, you're not leaving school when you're 12 or 14 and you're not working in a, a mill up yeah. in the north somewhere. So yeah. why are you fearful? Shouldn't you be quite optimistic because your life is so much better than your grandparents who, or great-grandparents who are around at this time? Yeah, I know, I, I think that's a thing that I think about a lot, how, I don't know, strange it is that we're not more optimistic, but I think because in 1909 there was nationalism, there was a lot of things that brought people together. There was the church and stuff, whereas now we kind of have a lack of that. So it's kind of, we don't belong. Like there's, I don't know, I think it's too. Um, I, don't okay. know. That's good. That's good. I don't know much about futurism, but from what I understand, people saw the opportunities and the future was very near and they were very excited. But the future, the, the gap between the present and the future is very, very small right now that we really see it in the eye. We look at, look, look it in the eye. We can see what it is. And for some people, they think it, this is a huge opportunity because whatever you do, you see the results. And there are so many people doing so many things at the same time that it's almost the future has almost become the present itself. It's difficult to differentiate between the two. So some, I'm pretty sure that so many people who are overwhelmed by this. It's never happened before in history. Okay. So um, I, I don't see it as a bleak thing. I see it as different. It's very, very different. That it's difficult to um, digest. That the future is so, so near that we need to think of it, think about it in a different way, I think. Maybe people are more fearful these days because they've seen the sort of the the failure of the project, really, or something, or, or people are more inured to their to their roles that they feel they have to adhere to, whereas things maybe at the turn of the 20th century, there was a lot of potential, and, and people, I, you know, I think of these sort of early avant-garde figures, and they were speaking so much outside the society and, and really sort of placing themselves, um, trying to create new roles for people. I just think they were incredibly brave, and. And they made this huge kind of uh, they made these huge revolutionary statements. Whereas now maybe, you know, it's the failure of modernism. Really, we we, we realise that those dreams 
weren't sort of realizable maybe um, and so maybe that's why people are a, bit, a little bit more timid. If um, I was born uh, in nine, in, at the end of the century, last century, I would have been probably a futurist, actually, for sure, a futurist. You know, if you think uh, Italy, some of you see the world uh, that is a very uncertain place now, but at that time, um, you know, Italy was poor, was divided. After unification with the promise of uh, uh, really unified culturally and economically, Italy had uh, a big differences and it was still regional. Um, there was no common language. There were 14 million people emigrating uh, in, uh, you know, towards the South America um, and, and America. Um, and uh, the political elite was totally, totally unable to uh, you know, enact a project. So these were young people like you, really, really tired and fed up of how uh, you know, politics was uh, not uh, um, uh, delivering any um, well-being, well-being is a, a bad word, but uh, you know, a, a, any welfare um, for the Italians. Well, no, this is interesting because, of course, you know, you, you, you've just made a very interesting point. You said, uh, oh, nationalism was bringing people together somehow, you know. And so uh, what is interesting is that, in a way, yes, it was a difficult period for Italy, a difficult time, and Italy was a backward country, and uh, here they come, this group of artists and intellectual put, intellectuals put it together, putting together a project which is uh, artistic and political at the same time, and is based on nationalism. And so, again, here we are at the beginning of the 21st century, but not thinking so much in aesthetic terms, but you know, the question is still there. So is nationalism, is a nationalist project still capable of revitalizing politics, of bringing people together, the disaffectionate, the people who feel that have been left out? Is it still there? Is it still like that? I think it's important that we don't sort of see historical links causally as inevitable. So if in 1917 I'd watched the Russian Revolution happen, I would have thought it was the most fantastic thing in human history. That doesn't mean that it was inevitable that by 1930 Stalinism yeah. was there. And I, and I think it's the same for the experience of, of futurism. We want to be historically specific about the conditions that gave rise to these things. So. Um, I don't have a problem with futurism from that point of view. Um, I do have a problem with aspects of futurism which I think throw into the world certain ideas um, which then have a legacy which is picked up by other people in other historical conditions. And I think we can learn certain things from futurism, um, some good and, and some bad. I mean, for me, progress is a complex sort of compound thing. It's material progress in which we have greater freedom from scarcity in order to control our lives, and technology is an important part of that. And we have political freedom. Those are two elements. And I think the limitation of the futurist movement is that this was really driven by the first thing that I mentioned. It was an emerging um, section of the elite that felt very constricted by the old political systems and had a good impulse to break things down, but at the same time um, were um, devoid of any sense of agency of how they would deliver things. So for me, the person that said the futurists are presentist rather than futurists, I agree with. Their problem was that they didn't look to the transformative movements in society that existed all across Europe. They ignored those. Instead, they went for a nihilistic, experiential view of how change would come out, as if it was in the air, and somehow you could just get captured by that agency in the air. Yeah, I think there's been a, a bit of confusion between progress and, and sort of change, because if one looks back historically to uh, when futurism uh, and the manifesto came out, it was, uh, it, it was just a few years before the beginning of the Great War. And what's interesting about the conditions of, uh, 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 and the response of the intellectuals and artists across Europe to the First World War was to 
to go to ground and support their own countries. Any sense of internationalism, any sense of universalism was, was pretty much uh, 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 rejected by m most, if not all, uh, 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 the artists and intellectuals, with a few exceptions, with a few exceptions. So, uh, one could say that 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 that, that, that the, uh, just following on from what was just previously said, that the the, the 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 lack of regard to what were the progressive elements in society then, you know, i.e., the working classes and so on, resulted in in intellectuals becoming. Uh, an artist becoming disembodied from uh, society and, and going off in all sorts of different directions after the First World War. Uh, now, you contrast that to today, and just very briefly, contrast that to today, and to this gentleman in front of me who was tired and exhausted, uh, um, you know, I'm sorry, very sorry for that. Uh, humanity is not tired and exhausted, uh, I can assure you of that, and the world will go on and there'll be immense and exciting futures if only we uh, uh, were to, uh, just like the intellectuals in the First World War, start thinking about alternatives and thinking about who, who are the agents of change in the future. I have a question to the panel about what I consider the current day futurists, which is a couple of uh, guys in Silicon Valley, like uh, Ray Kurzweil, for instance, and Jared Diamandis, I think his name is. Uh, these are extremely optimistic people talking about exponential growth of technology. I mean, it's the exact same speed, power, energy, and optimism that uh, I recognize in the futurists uh, uh, a century ago. Um, and they're in Silicon Valley. There's a couple of things I find a little bit scary about them, which is a complete technological determinism where you can either get on board or stay behind uh, with technology. Uh, but also I'm, I'm trying to find, is there something like uh, a really dark side of this, uh, uh, of this current day futurism there that you might recognize or point out that might make us sensitive and prevent a fascist movement in a couple of years after this movement grows? Yeah, it's just following on from some of the points that were made by Penny and about the kind of historical context within which we read futurism and particularly kind of its relationship to nationalism and its relationship to fascism. I think there's a danger in that we read history backwards because kind of if you look at the kind of futurist and the external, the, the so-called hyper-nationalism, if anything, fascism is a reaction against that, because Elizabeth talks about the kind of the futurist opening up public spaces, of opening up society to critique and discussion. And it seems that fascism is a kind of reaction to that, to a, an attempt to close down uh, debate, an attempt to close down public spaces. And if you look at the kind of iconography of fascism, it's the antithesis of futurism. It's the past. It's a retreat into the past. So the kind of futurism, there is no, this idea that kind of futurism logically leads to fascism is reading history back to front. It's got history upside down. You can appreciate the aesthetic of, of futurism as uh, the sort of part of the avant-garde in that time, and you can appreciate that conditions in Italy uh, at that time uh, meant that um, it was difficult for uh, people to, you know, for futurism to become a, a, a sort of what we would think of as a progressive movement linked with, with a, a wider section of society. I can see how all that came about. I think the problem with futurism for me is that um, the, 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 the way that it rejects any relationship to the past. And I think that is something, that's its legacy, I think, for, for the present day, if you like, because since uh, World War I, that, that has been... Uh, the, the, the general feeling, a rejection of the past, a rejection of the achievements of the past, a, re a rejection of, of the heritage that, that, that we've had, which the futurists, I think, were, were the sort of avant-garde of, 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 of doing that. Uh, and that's the negative side. You can't have progress without uh, a relationship with uh, past human achievements, uh, in my view. Brilliant. I think it would be quite good if you feel like it to, to address this sort of rather sen bleak sense, perhaps, of uh, the future that, you know, art is dead, um, the future is dead, um, mm. we haven't really got anything much to look forward to. 
Um, and perhaps if we look forward to the future too much, that's quite dangerous. But, you know, feel free. Now, Elizabeth spoke first, so we'll let her speak last. Oh. Simona. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a bit of a tall order. Um, well, first of all, um, a, a couple of points regarding futurism and fascism. Uh, this, you know, is, is not a kind of an easy kind of point to resolve. Um, of course, we have to be careful about the chronologies. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, futurism precedes fascism. And, of course, there are uh, areas of futurism, uh, for instance, the fact that they were completely sort of against uh, any form of um, sort of a structured government, um, parliament, and so on, which, of course, you know, didn't really uh, sort of, they weren't taken up by fascism. But also, to be fair to history, the futurists supported fascism throughout the regime until the bitter end, especially, I mean, Marinetti. Um, and, uh, and actually, uh, the uh, fascism's cultural politics were such that uh, sort of classicism and uh, modernism coexisted as uh, expression, artistic expressions of the regime. So the regime had a, a very pronounced um, sort of uh, um, favor for modernist expressions. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, we can't sort of go back and say that the futurists were proto-fascists, but the futurists after 1922, and in fact, after 1919, you know, the futurist history goes parallel to fascism. Um, now, how, how if, are we, I don't know, is there any future to look forward to? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, What's happening in, in Silicon Valley? Well, there's a, as you were saying, uh, you know, there is a belief in the future. There is a future, as uh, quite a few of you have remarked. Of course, uh, what, are, what are the dangers? I think the dangers are, you know, if we start kind of uh, um, discarding individual agency, then it all becomes quite determinist. So, I think an attention to the individual, and, and therefore, um, to if you want the kind of humanist side of things is is, is important, uh, and it's something that you know needs to be sort of perhaps preserved. Um, I don't know if we can look forward to the future much, but. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, well, every, all the negative things I sort of say about futurism, I, I say with a sort of proviso that. I'm a huge admirer of futurism. It, it's, it spoiled every other movement for me when I encountered it. I, it's just so rich in ideas, um, so sort of uh, profligate with ideas. Um, I just think it's incredible. But I do recognize um, it, its shortcomings. I would say that when Marinetti said progress is always right, even when it's wrong, he's going too far. But I do think their optimism and their faith in the future uh, is good because at least the future has sort of potential to get better. Uh, there's, there's a potential there. And going back to the past is it, always colored by sort of romanticism and uh, rose-colored glasses. And I think this is personally what we're seeing today with, with Brexiteers, this, this vision of, a, of an England that once was, which, which doesn't exist anymore. And it's frankly, it's just completely trite and ridiculous. Um, so I would be, I would be very uh, much in, in favour, and I am very much in favour in their forward sort of looking momentum. Um, again, I would, I would say that um, futurism and fascism were both very contradictory, uh, incredibly contradictory, and uh, although futurism stressed, stressed the machine, um, it also had a very pronounced human aspect as well, and fascism wanted to be seen as unprecedented, but it also wanted to be seen as very, very modern. So. Um, I think that's a, it's a very complicated relationship there. I don't think fascism was just about celebrating the past. Um, but one, one, more, one more quick thing. I do think there is a certain amount of um, historical inevitability with, with, with futurism and fascism. Uh, the futurists you know, pretty much pioneered the tech te te uh, technique of going out brawling on streets. They were interventionists. They uh, supported Mussolini from the word go. And as Simona said, they continue to do so throughout the regime. So 
I, they, they created the groundwork, as far as I can see, to a certain extent. Thank you. Elizabeth, uh, fling your challenge to the stars. Okay, yeah, uh, I would like to repeat that, actually. Um, um, in uh, 1918, uh, um, uh, the futurist, uh, actually Marinetti, wrote uh, the manifesto of the Italian Futurist Party. And I invite you to read it. And it's very, very interesting. And I think that Mussolini rejected, actually, futurism. And in fact, he, he never accepted that, that futurists were the state art, for example. And I think that, that he rejected um, you know, uh, Marinetti and, um, on the basis of what he was saying uh, in uh, the Futurist Party. Uh, Marinetti was against the policing of uh, the individual. He was pushing the individual to be individual in a collective effort to change the present for a bold vision of the future. Now, I agree that uh, um, the uh, vision of uh, uh, the rejection of the past um, is problematic for me as well. But here again, I go back to that time where the past was associated with this uh, absolutely, utterly useless uh, type of political elite. And uh, you wanted to, to um, you know, move forward and say, let's get rid of everything and re, re, you know, redo um, 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 Italy and Italian society. Elizabeth. Now, the, the thing that I really has to be treasure in the futurist movement is industrialization. You know, it was at the beginning of last century that they started to talk about how industrialization and mechanization will change the world. And this should be treasure now for us young people and, and less young people like me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.